Alright, well as we've seen, we do have a large can selection here. And archaeologists do kind of really like cans because it's a great way to date um, artifacts. And it's a great way to date the site in general because there are so many different kinds of cans, so many different ways that they've been opened throughout the times. There's a great actual can chronology that's um, in written record, so we kind of know what's going on with that, and we can actually date things. So, an example would be cone top, um, all steel, so a cone top beer can, though soda cans actually were made in uh, these as well. These kind of date to the probably 30s, 40s, 50s, 20s even for the, for the beer cans. Um, um, we also have the church key opening, and this is also a steel, steel or metal beer can. Another uh, knife opened can would be something like this. Once again, you've got kind of the, I guess, air intake and the stuff would come out of here. This is a condensed milk um, matchstick can, which is another good date. However, condensed milk still comes in cans like this. Um, we also have a coffee can. This actually had a lid on it, so it kind of just popped off, and you probably twist it um, with a little sardine kind of can opening, I guess. This is what looks like Lipton's tea. And once again, when you have all this writing on here, and you can actually see things, it's a good way to date. In addition to a large collection of cans, a wide variety of glass and ceramics was also found. So this is kind of a collection of different kinds of artifacts that we find at historical sites that can give us information about who lived here, um, when they lived here, uh, when, what kind of activities they were involved in while they were here. Um, we have two different categories here. Um, one is glass. Uh, one of the interesting things about glass as, as uh, artifacts is that the different colors kind of give us an idea of when people lived here. Uh, but the different shapes tell us what people were up to. Um, and one of the interesting artifacts that we have here um, pertaining to this site is this bottle base. This is um, clear glass, um, which doesn't tell us too much about age, but the shape of it tells us that it was alcohol. And one of the things we're trying to figure out about this site is that theoretically people were not supposed to have hard liquor here, but this bottle base uh, was probably whiskey or um, gin or something like that, but definitely a, a hard liquor that was brought in here. Um, and a lot of times you find liquor bottles sort of stashed in different places because people didn't want anyone to find out that they were drinking, so they drink off in little corners and, and dump them into places like privies and things like that. Um, another piece of glass that we have here is this ink bottle. Um, and you can tell that it's an ink bottle by the shape of it. So the, the bases of bottles are really important. Even when they're broken, the base can tell you what it is. Um, and another handy thing about bottles is that lucky for archaeologists that when people made bottles, a lot of times they stamped them with the manufacturer of the bottle, uh, but also the, uh, a date code that tells what year it was made and sometimes where it was made. Um, and you can find those on the, the bottom of bottles a lot of times. And there are books that you can find that help you figure out what those codes are. While some complete bottles were found on the site, most glass was broken and in shards, and it took experienced archaeologists and sharp-eyed volunteers to decipher their clues. I just picked up this piece of like a turquoise blue glass, and it looks like the bottom of a bottle, and I can see the number um, six embossed on it. It just caught my eye because it's an unusual color of blue that I wouldn't usually find in a glass jar or bottle. Another really informative artifact for town sites and things where there were different kinds of people, families and bachelors and maybe different kind of classes of people, is ceramics. Um, ceramics can tell us a lot um, about what people were doing if they were storing things in a vessel like this um, or if they were serving things in something like a teacup. Um, the different decoration styles on the ceramics kind of give us a little bit of an idea of how much money people were spending on their ceramics. Um, and if you have many different patterns, it kind of tells you if there was a family that had a lot of different kinds of ceramics, um, a lot of different table settings and things like that. Um, also, there are a lot of uh, anecdotal stories in history of um, men whose wives pass away or they, or they get divorced 
and then remarry that the new wife always throws out the old wife's uh, china pattern and gets a new one. So sometimes you find whole china sets dumped into a privy or something like that, and that, that means that the, the man got married again, and it's, and it's a new wife who wants her own china sets. So. The Passport in Time program allows the Forest Service to learn much about the cultural history of its forest lands through the use of its volunteers and archaeologists working in collaboration with one another. Through the PIT program, much was learned about Old Roach and tie hacking in this part of the Roosevelt National Forest. Archaeologist Nicole Branton summarizes the results of the first year of this project. And this is really kind of the beginning of a project that will be a much longer project, I hope, um, to find out what was going on at that site. So we've just gotten started this week um, documenting those individual features. And um, hopefully this is going to help us learn more about the history of this area, the history of the Forest Service, as well as the history of logging in this area. Um, and to understand how to manage those sites and how to preserve them better up here in what's kind of a remote part of our forest. And hopefully it'll be an ongoing project.